Hey podcast listeners, if you're looking for a job in games, check out jollygoodjobs.com. It's got thousands of jobs at over a hundred studios, and you can see where they are on a street level map. In today's episode, recorded in late 2015, I talked to Lyle Hall, the founder and CEO of Heavy Iron Studios. This week we talk about bringing Disney Infinity 3.0 to mobile, how he went from working in a video game store to running his own studio, and what it's like to close a studio, and what it's like to save one. From jollygoodjobs.com, it's the Jolly Good Show! Discussing the games industry and life within it. Here's your host, Mark Pope. Hello and welcome to the Jolly Good Show. In recent weeks, I've spoken to several people I knew from my time at Heavy Iron. This week, I'm going straight to the top. I'm sitting down with Lyle Hall, President and CEO of Heavy Iron. Hey Lyle, how's it going? Good, Mark. How are you? Good, good. So, I'll just kind of uh, recap how we met. I've, uh, we first met, first met when I came to America in 2003 to work at Heavy Iron. And I worked there for a total of 11 years. And we, we started out quite far apart. Like, you know, I was just one of the, one of the programming drones. You're in the uh, ivory tower. Uh, and then gradually over time, I got promoted up and, and we ended up working together a lot. And uh, these days, we're, um, I'm no longer at Heavy Iron, but but we're still friends and uh, hang out and eat Mexican food and such. Um, carnitas. Carnitas, yes, with the uh, with the flour tortilla. So anyway, for the uninitiated, um, can you tell us a bit about Heavy Iron, where you're located, what you've done in the past, and what you're doing at the moment? So so before we do that, can we talk about you for a second? Because uh, yes, I actually met you slightly earlier than 2000. Three. It was uh, December of 2002 when I think you came over uh-huh. uh, to see the studio. Uh-huh. And uh, th- th- there are immigration officials listening. Yes, so just, exactly. Just uh, well, so. it's you know THQ. They're no longer around. They're the ones responsible for this uh, silliness. <laughs> but uh, uh, we had you come over and, and do the interview in person. And uh, uh, I was very directly involved in helping set that up and obviously getting your visa approved your work visa approved to come over and work in the states uh, which i think took a you know six weeks or so mm-hmm. um during the course of christmas and the new year but what you were doing was very important uh because we were trying to port scooby-doo our our new big game mm-hmm. uh to the xbox uh, the very original xbox and so you were working i think all by yourself on that before you uh left to go back to england you had a chance to spend some time with the code i think you actually got the game up and running mm-hmm. before you left uh I think it was in less than two weeks. I think it was like four or five days. Mm-hmm. Actually, when, it get, the, it when gets we short, saw it. it gets shorter each time. Yeah. Like well, you were only there for two weeks, yeah. but I do believe before the first week was up that that it was less than a handful of days. It, it was something you could you could drive Scooby Doo around the screen, which is pretty cool. So we were pretty happy that we we were making a good hire. So mm. so uh, fast forward, like you said, so many years later, when you're the studio technical director. Yeah. Uh, and and, and thanks, it's a, it's a good thanks, arc. thanks 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 for bringing me over because sure. it, it's working out pretty well. Absolutely. Also, made sure you got paid. Oh yeah, that yes, was good. That's, that's important. Yeah, yes, that's important. <laughs> All right, so cool. So, so, uh, so heavy iron. Yeah. Um, who are we? What we do? That, that uh, hasn't been covered yet by your uh, illustrious. Who is Mark Pope and and Jol- the Jolly Good Show? Well, we've we've probably touched on it a bit, but um, it, it'd be best to to get it more straight from the horse's mouth. So Heavy Iron Studios is, is a uh, now an independent developer. Uh, located in Los Angeles. Uh, it's been around for 16 years, originally founded as a THQ studio in 1999, and uh, then became Heavy Iron Studios Incorporated in June of 2009, when we left THQ and became a privately held independent company. Mm-hmm. Uh, over the course of all those years, we've typically and traditionally worked on high-profile, big, kids, family license, uh, licensed films or television properties, a lot of Pixar stuff, The Incredibles, Ratatouille, Wally Up, a couple of really big and uh, fan favorite SpongeBob SquarePants games that we still get emails and Facebook posts and uh, imploring fans asking us to find a way to get the license back and mm-hmm. either make a up-res version of Battle for Bikini Bottom or the movie game, which you worked on. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I th- Well, actually, you worked on both games, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, the movie game you were the lead on. Uh, we, we literally get at least an email or a Facebook post a week 
uh, where we get somebody asking us either to up the game to current platforms or to make a sequel or to make a new one. Um, in fact, there's fans out there doing crazy stuff. Uh, I think somebody's actually remaking the, the Battle for Bikini game from scratch. Wow. Yeah. Like, dissembled the code and extracted assets and... Huh. Yeah. Uh, do you remember the SpongeBob Muscle Pants boss? We had a concept for and we built a model and a prototype and someone left it on the disc. Oh, yeah. Which, you know, back in 2003, I don't think people thought too much of that type of stuff. I mean, it was just a... So I think when we did our build process, we didn't call some of the di the levels uh -huh. that we we didn't we basically were not including. Right, right. So some of these things ended up on the disc, and people have found these lost levels, and they have written and done YouTube videos. I mean, it's out there. It's crazy how uh, how to what lengths people have gone to because of their passion for the game. It's fun. It's it's awesome to see. Mm, it's really cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's the sort of like most of the time. And what what have you been working on in the last? Uh, what, so recently? since we've been an independent company, we've done a little bit of of the same uh, recently in terms of working on big high-profile kids and family stuff. We've been working on Disney Infinity uh, for the last three years, 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. And uh, before that, we were doing some Kinect stuff for the Xbox 360, uh, did some fitness titles and uh, some stuff for Microsoft First Party. And uh, just launched Disney Infinity 3.0 toy box on the iOS and Android and Amazon store about a month ago. And uh, are working on some, some updates and patches and some new things for that and uh, some other stuff as well, it's coming down the line that we can't uh, identify specifically, but it's exciting. Mm -hmm. And then we also just recently uh, self-published Fat City, our very first original game on digital console and uh, mobile tablet. That's available actually right now on the Amazon App Store for Android. Cool. So Infinity, I've not I've not played that one. I'm bought into the Skylanders realm at the moment, but um, Infinity Three, that one's got the Star Wars characters in it. It, it does. And I've not had a chance to play that yet, but I, but I like Star Wars. Star Wars is cool. What, uh, what was it like working on Infinity 3 and, and getting to play with the Star Wars characters and bring it to mobile? For the for 3.0, I mean, the cool stuff really is the uh, the Jedi and Sith powers that that, uh, that Avalanche brought to the gameplay and, and character combat system that they had expanded with 2.0 and the Marvel characters with the skill trees. Uh, being able to do some really wicked uh, lightsaber gameplay uh, i think the guys in england over at uh gosh i always forget their their uh their name for two minutes and it'll come back to me it's but not sumo no. no not sumo sumo's doing the cart racer which actually also looks fantastic when you see mickey and minnie in that little uh disney car uh -huh. rolling down the country road at the very beginning if you haven't played it, uh the game the the intro this time around i just read a review today that said it was the best of the, th of the three that had been built and i think the very first time we all saw the first one it was literally Disney magic on a, on a video game screen, so that, that's a pretty big compliment to say the third one's the best one. But they have got vignettes of what you can do in the game, and one of them's a, a kart racer preview, and it's Mickey and Minnie in this really cool kind of Disney, very bright, colorful scene. Uh, that's what Sumo did. Um, now, these are uh, these guys did uh, Heavenly Sword and uh, Ninja Theory. Ninja Theory. Okay. There we go. So Ninja Theory, I believe, had, had uh, a pretty big hand in doing some of the lightsaber combat because of their experience doing weapon sword combat with heavenly sword devil may cry mm. odyssey that's cool things like that yeah so 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 heavy iron was bringing the game to mobile and it, it's primarily kind of like a it, the lead the lead platform is console and it's yep. kind of focused on console what's it like bringing it to mobile and how can how can you bring the experience across without making it worse and and, and in fact you know trying to make it better like how does that go that is a a Big challenge uh, because you are uh, inheriting some awesome content, but it's content that's being really made for a console game mm -hmm. and console controllers, most mm -hmm. most importantly, uh, or console connectivity because of the multiplayer side of things, which is important to uh, to the Infinity experience, especially the toy box, which is the primary focus of the mobile tablet game, is the toy box where you can bring all the characters together and bring all the toys together, and you can build anything you want to and play in in that uh, space. Um, the the big challenge really is in how we present the game to the player, how we how we adapt the controls of a dual analog stick and a bunch of you know uh, direct access twitchy buttons into what's a lot of work at trying to make something as elegant in a touch screen context as possible. A lot of that really comes down to redoing the menus, uh, the way the menus are navigated, the way the menus are presented in terms of, of buttons and. Uh, things that basically support touch screen swipes mm -hmm. swipes and taps and 
uh, things like that. That permeates all of the menu navigation, you know, UI navigation, and then of course the controls. Uh, it's very different trying to drive a 3D character in a 3D space, especially from a third person standpoint, uh, with a with a touch screen. You know, so that's one of the reasons why we have a virtual controller kind of mm -hmm. uh, approach to this game as opposed to something that's a little more generically touch. We tried that on 2.0 and, and uh, did some, I think, brave things, uh, but I think they didn't really work mm -hmm. as well as we had hoped or expected. So we went back to a little more of a hybrid this time and um, really have, I think, done a better job with the controls, knowing there's even more characters and even more different avatar types. Uh, and I'm really excited about the update that we're going to be doing at some point in the future that uh, really improves the, the controls. Mm -hmm. Is it... Um... I should have checked this out before, but is it is it free and then you buy it toys? It is. That's actually the other uh, the other thing that I didn't mention. Um, that is actually a huge challenge in terms of what our job is. Is we're taking a uh, a game that's essentially sold as a either thirty dollar to sixty five dollar starter pack, depending on, on whether you have one point two point zero. I, I didn't know if you knew this, but if you have one point zero um, or two point zero, or maybe it's both, you can buy three point zero digitally, uh, and it's only thirty bucks. Hmm. And then they reduced the price of the starter packs this time down to $64. I think they were about 74 or 84 before, mm -hmm. uh, which is great. But we're taking that exact paradigm of somebody going to a store and spending their money and then bringing the game home and playing it. And we're turning that on its ear completely and basically making it a free digital download from the iOS App Store or the Android Google Play Store and uh, giving the toy box a way to play in and then tweaking the console game, so to speak, so that it's presented in a way that's appropriate for free-to-play. So we've got character sampling, we've got uh, daily rewards for retention, uh, we've got challenges that give you daily challenges that you come back to and play uh, once a day that you can earn sparks and, and game currency. And, and so there's there's uh, reasons to have that kind of uh, mobile game relationship with the product that you wouldn't have necessarily with a console game. Mm -hmm. and, and so this is out now? It's out now. Uh, the other cool thing I, I think is unique about this product too, that, that uh, and you got to give Disney a lot of credit, especially on the tech side, is if you and you have to have a disney id uh, really to to play to play the game in general but that disney id actually saves all of your your data and toys between both the free to play game on mobile tablet or pc and the console game oh, so okay. if you buy the console game and you play it and you earn and unlock and open a bunch of stuff or you buy some toys uh -huh. and then you download it and you play on your mobile tablet when you log in with your disney id you'll have all those toys available to play all those characters available to play. It's pretty cool. Any, any of you build a, a sandbox, um, a sandbox level uh, out of toy park? box? Sorry, toy toy box uh, level. Um, uh, does that transfer across to console? Yes. Well, that's cool. And you can upload, you can build stuff in the toy box and upload it to the cloud. Uh, it's curated by some Disney folks uh, to make sure that all the content's appropriate, and then you can download it on any other device, whether it's a PC, mobile tablet, or any of the consoles uh, that that Infinity's out on. So That's you can cool. share that content anywhere. Cool. And our, our totally cool touchscreen interface for manipulating the things in the toy box, you know, works just as well as it does with the controller. That's cool. So uh, what I want to talk about next is kind of uh, you being head of the company. I imagine there's sort of young people out there that are like, I really like games. I wish I had my own game game company. <laughs> and uh, so I kind of want to get it, get into that a little bit. You started off, well, way back when you were a kid, kind of, you know, working in a game store, and then you got into, like, QA, and then worked your way up. Uh, so, sort of. I mean, we didn't even have QA. Uh, I mean, really, it was a production role uh, straight straight out of working in the, in the video game store and, and graduating from high school. And as I was entering into college, working for, uh, for Virgin at the time, um, fellow, fellow Brit. Yeah. Right? Uh, and and really we, we were called producers. That's what we called. That's what people at the studio who did what I did were called. And yet the job was just smaller because the project and the people and the scope was so much smaller. And yet the job was bigger in the sense that you wore so many more hats and you did things like tested and played your own games and wrote both qualitative feedback to the developer on what was good or not good about the game, but also really the bugs. We would have a QA department. We'd have mm -hmm. a QA staff. You were the guy who QA'd your game. Wow. I wrote I wrote the manual for our game, mm -hmm. uh, you know, things like that. So you, know, you did you did all kinds of things that you would never really think about doing in a, in a more formal context. The way that, context, the way that the industry is is uh, evolved and grown. So so in your first 
job in the industry then uh, you're you're a produ producer you're uh, you're basically doing production role type stuff doing QA type stuff burning EPROMs when we were doing console games to put on the cartridges you uh -huh. know, things things that as companies got bigger and, and you know more formalized those things would never be done by producers they would be done by you know a QA staff or IT staff or things like that so you know we were ordering our own EPROMs you know we were ordering our own cartridges through Sega I mean all, all this stuff was uh -huh. yes here's another example we were on the phone with Sega or Nintendo um, eventually Sony and things like that but uh, back in the early 90s when it was Sega and Nintendo you know we were the ones also communicating with our third party counterparts at, at Sega. That's not something mm -hmm. that, that the producer really does in a traditional game publisher anymore either. So, mm -hmm. And and so at that point, at that point, the, the first company, Virgin, then mm -hmm. um, you were on the publisher side of the, uh, of the equation. So not, not working directly with the development team, right? So I was there for about two and a half years before I, I left. Uh, and when I got there, we were only working with uh, third party studios outside of we had no internal development uh, except for we had a couple guys the guy who hired me Graham Devine uh, who's now at Magic Leap he's the uh, I think chief creative officer at Magic Leap uh, and Dan Chang who's at Nintendo uh, in the tech department there uh, they were working on a game by themselves uh, it was a seven up spot kind of related game uh, based on attacks or a uh, but like go, we've, we've talked about that a long time ago. Uh -huh. uh, but in, in any event, uh, that was the only internal development we had. Otherwise, every game that we did, you know, Virgin was a publisher, not a developer, but we were experimenting with, with Graham and, and, uh, and Dan doing stuff. Uh, and then we had a couple other guys that we'd hired. It was very, very small, but we, we grew that into a, a really significant internal presence. Uh, so as we continued to build our publishing side and work with developers, you know, that's that's how I ended up really an internal side of development is, is wanting to be you know, involved in making a the game and, and having a, an affinity and, a, and a, an aptitude for that. So by the time I left, you know, I was, you know, I spent a lot of time in Las Vegas working with Westwood Studios when it was around and they were doing Dune 2, the building of a dynasty and Legend of Crandia uh, because I was a developer producer, really, you know, mm -hmm. a publisher producer. But growing up in publishing, especially at that time, really taught you what it was like for a product to be made and finished and shipped. And it was a good experience, especially because I spent so much more time on the development side following that hmm. so um what did you do to get into that production role like um you can't get i a got really lucky you can't get a degree in being a producer not yet um so you, you just you just you, you just got lucky uh silvery well, tongue I mean, or I something mean, or... well i mean not at all slept I, your I, way I, in that, that's <laughs> I, yeah, I wish it was that fun uh, that uh that that uh, salacious um you know, really just being a kid who was genuinely passionate about games and played them to death and, and, you know, happens to be a little bit analytical and, you know, didn't know that whatever I was saying was actually interesting or meaningful to anybody else. I mean, it was just what I thought about in my interview was playing something that wasn't done yet. Uh, that ironically, David Perry uh, was programming at the time. Hmm. Uh, and Nick Broody, for those who know him, uh, was doing the art. And, uh, and Neil Young uh, from... Uh, Gosh, what's the company he sold to? Uh, NG Moco. Uh, eventually, he worked at Virgin before he worked at Probe in England. Uh, this is one of the things I admire about you. You've got this kind of like encyclopedic <laughs> brain that it's remembers just old. everybody's names. No, well, I, like I'm, I'm of a similar age. Well, these people I can't, are, I can't remember what I had for breakfast. <laughs> they're, they're, uh, they're celebrities in this industry to a certain extent, so I guess that's one of the reasons why I remember them so much. But they, they certainly had a large impact on me as a, a young person growing up because these were professional guys that I was getting to work with that had done this before. And here I was some kid who just had graduated from high school and, and had no really idea what I was doing. I was just making it up as I went along and watching the other people that uh, I worked alongside. Um, to to sort of figure out what they were doing right and what made sense and to you know some things occur to you that just that's not a really good way to communicate with people or, or to handle things um, you know but just asking questions too but in any event uh, it was really one of those things where I had spent time working with a coworker at the game store I had met the guys at, at Word for Virgin repeatedly when they would come into the store and and talk about games and buy games and uh, so you know really. It, it being a very cottage industry back in the 90s, you know, it was kind of like, oh, another guy who likes games. And when they had a position, I got a phone call from one of my former coworkers from the game store that had already gotten hired there. And like I said, it's lucky, you know, I mean, but I'd done something to make those people think that I might be a good fit there. And, and then they gave me a chance and, you know, it really worked out, obviously, uh, in so many ways. Uh, but like, I feel a lot of luck, you know, it wasn't mm -hmm. like I spent my whole life, you know, working 
training for that moment intentionally, maybe mm -hmm. unintentionally, certainly by spending all those time times in my room playing computer games and learning to program and basic and hating programming and uh, <laughs> not hating, but you know, not enjoying it mm -hmm. and uh, you know, getting my brother to drag me to the arcade and saving up all my quarters to spend on playing video games. I mean, those are things that you don't realize that, uh, you know, it's like there's a far side cartoon from a long, long time ago where it shows a, a kid playing Nintendo and uh, I think the mom or dad sitting at the breakfast table with the newspaper and it says, uh, you know, uh, plumber wanted to save a uh, princess mm -hmm. in a castle and that pays like a bazillion dollars. You know, <laughs> and then the parents like <laughs> looking at the case might be, yeah, 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 this might be a good thing. So I think that's happened to a lot of people we know and maybe even some of our own parents. <laughs> So, so when I met you, you were um, studio manager at Heavy Iron, and Heavy Iron's owned by THQ. So, so you're not the owner of the company. Nope. You're, you're just sort of paid to manage the studio and look after the people and make sure the product products get made and stuff. So you're an employee, but you're at the top of the top of the local food chain kind of thing. Sure. Um, how did you uh what was the sort of key moment for getting making that jump from like being a producer to being studio manager so in between the virgin part which we just talked about there was uh 12 years of of hard work mm -hmm. um in the video game industry you know it, it's it's very lucky and fortunate to say i got to work my ass off making video games mm -hmm. but literally worked my you know ass off sleeping underneath my desk and, and doing multiple all-nighters and, uh, you know, uh, damaging relationships with uh, potential loved ones or, or not seeing your family or going on trips and doing things which because you think what you're doing is so much more important than those things. Um, and in some ways it is, in some ways it's not, you know, it just depends on sort of where you are in your life at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, but I worked my butt off to put myself in that position where I got that opportunity to even interview the, for the job. And I, and I would also say the other combination is... Uh, I was gracious enough and professional enough and, and, um, uh, trying to think maybe what a third adjective would be, but humble enough. Uh, well, you know, hopefully, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, just messing. You know, hopefully I, I don't know, you know, um, like to think something you, you always work on is trying to be as humble as possible. But, uh, my point being that, uh, there was enough people that, that I had worked with that I had left a good impression on or with, or that had thought highly enough of me to, call me and say, hey, would you be interested in this general manager job? They're looking for somebody. And I think you'd be a really great fit. Um, and it was certainly, to your point, not something I had done already. Uh -huh. uh, but I had worked my way up to, you know, building a team from scratch multiple times um, where I'm, you know, employee one of that team, not employee one of that company, mm -hmm. uh, employee one of that team. And I've got to build a team and a concept and figure out what, how we're going to build it, what technology we're going to use, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So, uh, solving all those problems and putting all those things together, um, which is really what a producer does mm -hmm. is you, know, you try to put the whole thing together. You, you aren't doing any of it by yourself because you have to rely on all those great people that you need to make something. Uh, but you know what those things are. And so uh, having done that a number of times, uh, you know, to varying degrees of success, uh, and having guns consulting, having worked for myself, um, there's a bunch of things I, I did from 1999, uh, when I left DreamWorks, and that was sort of the last sort of formal full-time employee job I'd had in in production, so to speak. Um, and I was in France for a while. I did some consulting back in, in the States. Uh, so when I took the job in the studio, it was 20 people. And they had a game that was you know, about Alpha. It was a Scooby game. It was, it was I just had hit Alpha. It was about to hit Alpha when I was doing the interview. It was a week away from Alpha or something like that. Uh, but there was obviously a competent team there mm -hmm. that had been built. So I didn't need to do that. But... I didn't know how great the team was or where its strengths and weaknesses were. Uh, but knowing that there was a team and there was, they knew how to build something good and there was potential there, uh, that's a lot to work with, mm -hmm. right? And doing it from scratch is a lot harder, I think. Uh, in some ways, a little bit more fun and challenging, but in a lot of ways, a lot harder and, and, and less fun for that. Uh, so it was just, again, mm -hmm. I was ready for it. It really, so, really felt like I had I kind of you know done all the things I needed to do to be ready for that. Um, there's still a lot of things I learned that I did, never had, you know, never had done before. I'd never been the person in charge uh, in that building, right? Mm -hmm. There'd always been somebody else who was you know, more senior than me. Uh, but I was ready for it. So I think I think working working your way up and, and meeting all the people that you meet, uh, and, and then they, over time, they move around to different studios. And then, uh, you know, if you've done, if you've done a good job, then 
when they when they when they become aware of a spot that needs filling, they start thinking through like, well, who do I know? Uh, you know, ultimately, yeah, you, know, you came up and you know, that was that. I watched so many movies in the '80s about you know awful people on Wall Street and in business, you know, where it's all about stepping on people's backs and 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 you know climbing your way to the top. And I I find this for the this industry for the most part to be so not like that. There, it exists, and there's parts of it, and, and maybe even certain companies that that have reputations for kind of that being the mo there. But I would say, by and large, especially because of how small this industry was when I I started it back in 1990, uh, that the relationships that I've fostered and developed and maintained, and, and uh, they've really benefited me both personally and professionally, uh, and are part of why I'm still here. I'm mm -hmm. sure. You know. So. Uh... For for many years, uh, Heavy Iron was THQ owned. You know, well, from the beginning, it was THQ owned, and then, and and I was the uh, during that time, and it, it it was great. I had this feeling of being sort of bulletproof. Like we'd we'd make one project, and then there'd be another one lined up, and uh, there was just this kind of like um, pleasurable treadmill of, uh, of 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 creating uh, creating new games, and then like THQ started to seem a little. Uh, yeah, it was doing really well, and then um, it started to sort of falter a bit, and, and we'd hear of them closing a studio, and then another one, and... Um, I had to go close one of those. And uh, uh, yeah, You had to close one, yeah. And, you know, you know, ultimately, THQ ends up, uh, ends up closing, like, every, every studio, pretty much, and, uh, and shutting down. Uh, so... Over, over half of them, and I think, I think the rest were certainly part of the auction. Some of them got bought. Okay, right, yeah. So, but most of them went away. It was, you know, the, the sort of the axe was falling on these studios, and they were, you know, literally closing the doors. All the employees have to go away, go find other jobs, etc. And 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 well, we we survived a long time. It was it was good to say, which I think is a testament to the studio. But ultimately, uh, Heavy Iron's name came up. So, can you talk about that a little bit and how you got, you know, into the position that you're now in? Sure. Uh, I mean, you, you told a lot of it in the uh, in the setup that you know the THQ started to struggle. You know, time timing wise, it was you know two thousand six and seven were you know tremendous years uh, for the company. Um, two thousand eight was really the beginning of the end, even though it was almost like the first death row because they actually ended up kind of resuscitating and getting bigger again before they ultimately mm. imploded. Uh, but and I can't remember exactly how many studios we had in 2008. It was somewhere around 20, uh, somewhere around 20, and a lot of these studios were doing one game or had been purchased because of that one game or to do that one game, which is, um, you know, a strategy of sorts. Um, maybe not the best one, depending on what you're trying to do. But at the size that we were at, um, so we had tended to burden ourselves with a bunch of, and we were trying to do AAA stuff, so a bunch of very expensive games and studios. Uh, you know, we were a publicly traded company. We, we reported earnings every three months. Uh, I never knew what they were going to be before they were disclosed publicly. I wasn't at that high enough level of a company. Um, but being inside of a company, you still see enough, especially, at, you know, at, at that time, I was not just the studio general manager. I was also vice president of the company of, of THQ. Hmm. So I was overseeing multiple studios, including the one in Boston uh, and a little bit of, of parts of other things. And then obviously contributing at some corporate level to our product planning for you know the next three fiscal years uh, as well as getting certain reports on on what our sales were so a lot of this information if you're willing to pay attention and interested in paying attention to it you could see how healthy the company was and, and it's certainly interesting to somebody who'd already been there for you know 2007 2008 five or six years uh, and wanting the studio to your point to be relevant always especially as we got larger and larger and we had more and more studios you know there's more mouths to feed how you make mm -hmm. sure you stand out to, when you're one of 20 kids right uh, it's that kind of dynamic, especially when we had a certain niche of that we had filled really, really well. And that was certainly, it was clear that there was going to be problems in that space. And we had, as a company, way overpaid for those licenses for those movies that we had, you know, Ratatouille Wally up and then ended up not being the last one that no one did, uh, which could have been uh, brave. Uh, in any event, uh, at some point in, in 2008, and I, I'm trying to remember when it was, spring or summer, there was a round of studio closures, and one of them included uh, uh, Helix, which was out in uh, Boston, and they had done all that Game Boy stuff for us and, and uh, DS stuff for us, and 
uh, strategically, they were an important studio. They were small, they were efficient, um, they didn't cost very much to operate. Uh, they were just kind of out there in Boston, which was kind of, unfortunately, for as big a city that is far away from kind of THQ's, uh, you know, immediacy. Mm-hmm. Um, that was one of the things that, you know, we tried to do is involve them in, in everything. So, in any event, I was told that they had decided that, that was going to be closed. Uh, so, it didn't really get a lot of consultation on that. Um, you didn't get a chance to sort of, you know, defend them um, or explain why it made sense. You know, they were working on something that, that uh, was not they're doing like a DS version of the blob and it wasn't coming together and our marketing VP hated it. And so it just you know, sort of ill-timed and then, Hey, how do we get rid of some money? Right. You know, some expense. So the reason why I went through all the setup is they said, we're going to close the studio and they were sent out some corporate people. And, you know, I said, you know, I'm the only guy they ever see once every three months from THQ. I'm the only person that even represents the company. Yeah. I, I can't let you send a bunch of faceless, to them, people out there to just sort of, you know, show up and mm-hmm. shoot them all in the head. So I volunteered to do that because I felt like that was the best way for them to get a really crappy message. Mm-hmm. You know, there's no good way to do anything like that. But at least if they heard it from me, I mean, to not show up and have somebody go out. I mean, that's just, yeah. like I, a, I, I would have regretted that for the rest of my life. And I know that I, at some point I would have bumped into one of those guys and it would have been like, what happened? Why didn't you, like... You know, yeah, dumping someone by text yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I just, that's just not my style. And I, I couldn't do that. So I wanted to make sure that they got as taken care of as they could because these guys didn't know it was coming. They didn't mm-hmm. deserve it either. Mm-hmm. Really, they were you know, dollars for donuts, as, as I've said, actually, ironically, a couple of times in the last couple of days for whatever reason. Uh, the return on the investment there and, and the, the risk for the studio was, was so low. It was really a silly thing. It was you know, indicative of some of the decisions that were made at that time and, and moving forward, you know, until the, the company erupted. So, uh, as things continued to get worse and worse, and you know our games weren't looking like they were going to sell well, they weren't looking like they were going to be profitable, especially with the cost of the license uh, that we were guaranteed to pay up front, um, the cost of next gen, you know, uh, the fact that the Wii was was different than the other platform. I mean, just it really was kind of a bad uh, combination of things in our space of of kids, family, console games. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the fact that the Nintendo had done so well with the Wii, but the Wii wasn't the same kind of. Uh, graphics or, or, or technology as uh, Xbox and, and 360 and PS3. Uh, so it was clear that they were going to have to close more studios. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the, the shortest way to say this is we still had two games that we were working on. Uh, you know, we were starting to try some other stuff. We tried working on, on Megamind. Um, we tried working on the Avengers. Um, both of those were shipped to Australia f- to lower cost studios and cost centers. And anecdotally and ironically, this is back in, in 2008, uh, I believe at some point in that time frame, 2008, 2009, that was when the U.S. Uh, recession started. The Australian dollar went nuts <laughs> against the uh, <laughs> the U.S. dollar and made that a very not cost-effective cost right. center in Australia. It ended up making it almost you know as expensive, if not more expensive, because of the of the uh, the exchange rate going totally uh, you know inverse of what it typically does. So. In any event, you know, they took those two games away from us, right? And and that to me was, you know, you mentioned earlier about you know, probably seven or eight minutes ago in this conversation, that uh, comfortable treadmill or that happy treadmill. I mean, mm-hmm. that's one of the things that, that we'd always struggled with throughout the court history of, of console games is you build up a big console team, you ship the game, and then if there's not something that's next, what are they going to work on? And the bigger the teams got and the more you need bigger, you know, bigger teams for production size and just capacity... Uh, the bigger that problem became because what do you do with all those people when your game's over? Mm -hmm. So we really tried from the beginning when I got there to have enough games and enough growth and enough new games. That's why we did two and then three and, you know, Mm -hmm. to be able to, to, to not have to grow and shrink and grow and shrink like a lot of other studios did. It's, it's painful. It's expensive and, and, um, you know, unproductive. Uh, in any event that, that happened and that to me was pretty much writing on the wall that we would become an easy target Mm -hmm. because what are they doing next? Right. And they're doing two expensive kids games. You know, all the SpongeBob was was really cost effective because the license was still pretty good. Um, so I looked at this as an opportunity. Hey, we've got two games. Pixar and Disney now owns them. They're an important relationship. You know, THC is not going to want to screw this up. Nickelodeon, we've been partners with for I, I don't know a decade at, at, at this point, longer at, at THQ. They're not going to want to screw this up either. I, I know what the budgets are for these titles. I, I know how much these things cost. I know what it costs to run my studio. I know how much you know everybody makes. I know you know. Um, I had learned what at least operationally it costs to run a business, even if I wasn't the one paying the bills THQ was, but I had all this information. So I put all this together and said, well, you know, either we can volunteer to finish these things up and wrap the studio up, 
which I think they'd be very amenable to, right? Mm -hmm. make, make it all go away, right? But still finish our work. Uh, or I could use this and leverage this as an opportunity to do something with the studio. What else was I going to go look for a job to do? I thought to myself, close the studio, and then where am I going to go work? You know, what am I going to want to do? Well, I'd want to start a company. I want to build a team. I want to. I have all this outside of my office door, and I hired all these people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the other funny part. It wasn't like I just had gotten there and here the studio for the last you know seven years. I'd built this damn thing and hired every single one of those people except for maybe what at the time. Uh, you know, five, ten people that were still there from the original day, or at least longer than I was, mm -hmm. uh, which is also pretty cool. Uh, and it just just all made sense. You know, it took maybe a couple nights for me to think about and figure out. And I went back to THQ and I said, here's what I want to do. And they thought it was an amazing opportunity for them to get rid of the studio. Like, oh my God, you're going to make this go away and you're going to ship games and, and we have revenue and we can, you know, offset the cost. It, you know, it just made so much sense to them. It just was easy in that mm -hmm. sense because I was making it go away. That's cool. So you, because it's really expensive when you're a studio over. We were 130 people. Mm -hmm. I mean, federal and California labor laws require you to inform people and pay certain things. And so it's a publicly traded company. I mean, there's mm -hmm. just certain things that that uh, that it just made sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's cool. You 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 kind of solved the problem. You kept everyone at Heavy Iron employed because the you know it's now Heavy Iron um, as a separate company. Um, and you still ship the games, so it's kind of win-win-win. And also, out of that, you become the uh, uh, the the CEO in charge of it. So uh, you know you you get to sort of uh, you know, level up in your career as well. Um, so, so or, or, or set myself up to fail miserably very quickly in a very <laughs> public way. <laughs> yes, I mean it's a big risk. I mean, obviously, the the, the hope is that there's success there, right? But it was uh, it was scary. So. So what's it like now uh, being the uh, the Fat Cat CEO sitting on the throne of cash and calling all the shots? How's that working out? Uh, if in the context of being a Fat Cat sitting on the throne, I've actually lost weight since I became CEO. <laughs> so I think that probably illustrates the... Is that from nervous shaking? Yeah, it's not from because I have so much free time to exercise. <laughs> yeah, it's probably from uh, from anxiety. Uh, what's it like? You know, it's it's... You know, especially f to your point, you just said, you know, we, we really did a transition from THQ where we really made it a, you know, I made a very concerted effort. And I say we because, you know, I had some help, obviously, with with uh, key people like Lynn, who had just joined the company, really. I mean, God, you know, not even a year at this point. Uh, and and willing to take sort of this adventure with me. Uh, we wanted to try to keep people whole. We wanted to try to make it feel like a very seamless transition. I mean, obviously, you're working in the same space, same desk, you know, but the... Pay you know, paycheck was going to say Heavy Iron Studios and be signed by Lyle Hall, not say Heavy THQ Inc. and, and be signed by Brian Farrell. Um, I mean, that's kind of what we wanted the big difference to be for people uh, on a very sort of day to day or mechanical level. Um, th that was really, really important. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, six years out, the company's evolved a lot. Uh, the industry has changed so much in the last five or six years. Uh, I feel even m more grateful to be around, you know, even this year. Uh, having shipped Infinity 3.0, a uh, big, huge game, uh, self-published our own game, uh, you know, I feel just as grateful being around now as I did back when we had some of our darkest days you know, in, in 2012 and 13 when the industry was really, really uh, at a very low point in terms of, of just opportunity out there to do anything. Mm -hmm. so, um... so, so in terms of, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot of the same, you know, because we're at a studio, we make games, you know, none of that's changed. Uh, it's different because of the level of responsibility to make sure that there's enough money in the bank to pay people every two weeks and buy the stuff that we need and find new work and new contracts and new projects and mm -hmm. uh, still deal with all the same stuff that you had to deal with as a studio. You know, there's a bunch of people that work there that are really talented and yeah. have needs. That that uh, that paying people part. Um, when it, when I think about like okay, how many employees are at the studio and then what's kind of the average salary and. The, you know, add on some taxes and other fees, and then the rent, and like that must add up to a really hideously large number, like just every month. And um, it's cool if you've got a big project running, um, and you know, th there's money coming in to cover that. But but man, that must get stressful at times when you know one project's wrapping up and another one's not quite started, or you know. You're absolutely right, and all those things are true. And and uh, all, all I could do is repeat exactly what you said and underscore it by saying. There are those, and it's not very frequent, thank God, because it, it's not a good way to live and, and certainly not expecting or wanting any, any, any sympathy or pity. But when you have, and we've had, and I think anybody who's run a video game company or any business 
uh, that hasn't been just wildly successful from the, the get-go. Uh, yeah, there are some sleepless nights where you worry about what you're going to do if things don't work out, if you don't find that project, or if, if that payment doesn't even show up. Uh, you know, that's something that happened early on in, in the, the, the very early days of, of uh, Heavy Iron. Um, somebody paid us late, and uh, and we had payroll, and the bank called me and said that, uh, you know, we were overdrawn. This was, I mean, I definitely in the first year, but it was probably, you know, in the first six months. And, uh, you know, having to, f to figure out who to call that I could borrow some money from immediately uh, and, and not a few hundred bucks mm -hmm. um, to, to get that payroll covered. And I mean, literally, I think I got a phone call at like eight o'clock in the morning and I had to have it by 11 o'clock in the morning to the bank. So uh, that was a pretty sketchy three hours, wow. um, you know, and, and like it was pretty early on, too. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So um, something that occurs to me is that you're... you're um, your, the scale of money that you're used to thinking about in terms of work um, must be quite different to the scale that other people work on. Like, like if you're Bill Gates or you know uh, Warren Buffett or something like that, you know, a lot more zeros. The, the, yeah, yeah, they, they they kind of like think at a at a higher level. Whereas, you know, if I'm like, hmm, maybe I'll eat at this restaurant. Oof, it's twenty bucks for a burger. And like, I'm like, hmm, should I do that? You know. <laughs> <laughs> that must be just like rounding error when you're you're spending your days kind of thinking about like um it really was during the THQ days because we were a billion dollar company and and the revenue that the studio generated you know we reported these things obviously every month in terms of costs and 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 you'd see what the sales of of the games were uh definitely you know that type of thing is a rounding error especially when you're reporting you know um you know hundred of hundreds or hundreds of millions of dollars each quarter type of thing as as a company um you know, we're not certainly operating at that level as Heavy Iron Studios, uh, but you, you, you know, with I think part of it's age and perspective too. Uh, but yeah, you, you know, you deal with it. it's like when you haven't bought a car before, right? Mm -hmm. and you, you go buy a car, and you're like, you have to write a check for what? <laughs> yeah. Or maybe the first time you you get an apartment, you write your rent. I mean, there's all those sort of first awful big checks that you write, you know, yeah. as, when you're younger and growing up, right? And and it's almost the same. Like, you know, it's you feel it in your stomach when you write that thing out, right? <laughs> Um, and in some ways, it feels like an accomplishment when you can write that check and you know it's not going to bounce. Mm -hmm. Although it's certainly not good when, you know, that's going to empty your bank account, right? Mm -hmm. So, so, um, so to keep keeping on this vein for a moment, but um, you you've got to deal with a lot of kind of curveballs coming at you. You know, on any day of the week, someone might come into your office and say, "I'm quitting. I'm out of here," like right now, or you know, a project that you were banking on coming in to you know uh, for a team to work on might get pushed out or just go away entirely you know um your studio technical director might come to you every like three or four months and say i i don't want to do this anymore <laughs> for like a year or two and then you keep making him do it hey, you're talking about me now yes yes I, am, yes I am <laughs> yeah i may have done that um how so yes those things happen how how do you how do you go about dealing with sort of that level of stress and unpredictability. Like, I feel like if it was me, I'd just be kind of like rocking in a ball in a corner or something like that. Like, <laughs> how, do you, how, do you, how do you approach that? It's not any different at work, I guess, than it is outside of the office in terms of how I look at all that stuff. You know, pe uh, the world's full of people. Mm -hmm. People are woefully unpredictable and, uh, uh, impossible for you to control mm -hmm. I mean, that's just that's you know if you're if you're expecting people to do what you want or what you you know I mean, it just doesn't work that way you know and i think so it sounds like you so can, it's kind of a that's part of it an, an acceptance um, of the it's, unpredictability it's, yeah i would say it's, you have to accept it at some level because it comes with it's par for the court it comes along with people it comes i mean we all have relationships with you know our, our family growing up i mean if you have brothers and sisters i mean random shit happens all the time mm -hmm. uh and you know you can you can write those things off as being that that person is just that way but you know once you see enough of that stuff you realize the world's more that way than it just you know and obviously certain people are certain ways but hmm. that's also what makes it fun you know again that's as teams have gotten bigger and you've had to bring more personalities and more dynamic uh in, into trying to get something cohesive built and made uh you have to navigate that somehow successfully if you're going to get anything done so i do accept a certain amount of chaos not as something I enjoy or I'm comfortable with, but that 
it comes along with it and there's things that you that are out of your control that you can't and you try to react and respond to them as best you can and i think that acceptance gives me a bit of anticipation that when something crazy or bad happens it's like how bad could it be and then you know having been in this industry for 26 years i've seen some pretty crazy stuff so mm -hmm. um I, I, li literally i mean you know, like I, I don't want to challenge the universe to come up with new stuff that's like so <laughs> far beyond the crazy stuff i've seen but i've seen a lot of crazy stuff so right. I, I, or heard, seen and heard, right? I, I read one time, um, if uh, it, it was talking about, it gave the example of sort of driving in the car and someone cutting you up and, uh, you know, you're getting all upset about that. And, the, and what it said was, when you get into the car, you've got to sort of think for a moment and say, I'm getting in the car, I'm going to be driving, people are going to cut me up. And, and that is, you know, you, you sort of anticipate it and, and kind of accept it of like, yeah. I'm going to drive a car that's going to happen and then if you if you if you're approaching it from that mindset when it happens you're like oh yeah there it is it happened but but if if if, if instead you're uh, you, you approach it from a you know everything should go my way and you know then then when they cut you up you get really kind of yeah. angry about it yeah. so yeah I, I, and, it's a and, perfect a analogy it really is yeah um, As, that, that, that's what i'm hearing in what, in what you're saying you sort of like well, and the you can't funny, get too too upset about it because you just got to kind of anticipate that that kind of stuff's going to happen. And you have to fix it too. That's the other thing is that you can moan about it all you want, but you, you still have to do something about it, right? So if if my whole attitude or approach to any of these things was to lose my mind about it, that's just totally counterproductive to, to fixing it or solving it or figuring it out. You know, not because it's it because it needs to be right, not not because it's interesting or challenging. Because it needs to be. I mean, you know, you have to solve certain things, personnel problems, or you know. They are what they are, right? But I like that, going back to the driving analogy, I like it because I, I find myself to feel semi-schizophrenic only in the context of, of that reaction to, to being in the car and what other people outside of your car bubble are doing. Because they're not really doing it to you, they're just doing it, but uh -huh. it feels like some of those things are done to you, and I think right. that's what people turn into, like, you know, they feel victimized or, or antagonized or, or, you know, marginalized or whatever it is, right? Um, and it it's funny because sometimes... I totally have that Zen, like, hey, all right, buddy, you know, if you got it, you're in that much of a hurry. But then there's times where it's like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I, I, maybe it's how much I've eaten or, or, or uh, how stressful the day is. But I find that's a funny place where you can go through a gamut of emotions, right? Mm -hmm. So we're getting towards the end. So I, I, I want to sort of <laughs> change direction a little bit. What are, what are some of the, the, the best moments of being in charge of a studio, being in games development? What's the, what's the sort of happy, non-stressful, and uh, <laughs> joyful side of all this? I, I, it's not maybe the the ultimate one, but it's definitely one that occurs to me because, especially at this point, having been half of my career at Heavy Iron, which is really weird uh, to think that I spent that long at one place, even though so much has changed, uh, is making a good hire. You know that that's a uh, that's a good feeling. Uh, you know, uh, having e even kind of. Uh, making it person personal to this conversation, uh, you know, having some random chap from middle of England come over and interview and no, north of England, north just to north, be. <laughs> okay. um, We're a bit touchy about that. <laughs> there's not a lot of verticality there, so I do know what people north of you do and people south of you do. Uh -huh. We can't discuss this on the podcast, but right? Yes, I guess, I guess fairly fairly north. I was, you know, so you're not Midlands. You're actually. Oh yeah, I'm the, I'm from the north. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so you're a Stark. They're all dead. <laughs> what? Uh, yeah, you're a Stark. It's a Game of Thrones reference. Oh, okay. Yes. I hope I haven't ruined that for everybody who's listening. <laughs> um, anyways, in any event, um, you know, and, and, and seeing somebody like that, you know, like you grow from what you were doing to, you know, I mean, certainly where you are now, but what you were, what you did and what you accomplished both at, at Heavy Iron within THQ and at Heavy Iron, you know, as a, as a private company. Um, that's pretty cool, you know. Uh, uh, even people I inherited, like Dorothy, who's still there, you know, um, seeing her go from a junior artist to somebody who's led projects and who uh, defines you know, how things are being organized. Um, you know, those are just two examples. But I, I think uh, even hiring people that don't stay at the company for very long, but maybe do something really, uh, you know, it's a step up for them to do something at some level of responsibility, and they go on to do bigger, better, greater things. That's always been very satisfying for me wherever I've been and for, for all 20-something years. I mean, I think the first time I really got to hire somebody internally was at, at my second job at Crystal Dynamics. Um, so I didn't do any really hiring at Virgin, per se. I mean, we did interviews, and so I got, it wasn't my decision. Uh, but but people that I met even way back then that have gone on to do, you know, um, I met a, 
my best friend in the world is a guy named Noah Hughes, who's the franchise director on, on the Tomb Raider uh, games at Crystal Dynamics for the last, I can't even, however long Crystal Dynamics has been doing Tomb Raider games. You know? mm -hmm. uh, and you know, that's the one of the biggest games of the of the year and in the industry. And, and it's fun to, to know people like him that uh, you're close to that are doing amazing, cool, fantastic things. And you see them in the press and see what they're doing, mm -hmm. uh, you know, be, be hugely successful. Uh, that's the other part that's funny I think about being in this business and being in this industry is it is entertainment, but it's entertainment that, that I grew up loving and, and just like you, I'm sure it's like not everybody was else was into it. Right. So it felt kind of unique and special because I did get so much enjoyment out of it and to see it, it become what it's become and to see sort of the, the scope and spectacle of, of games and their, and their, their uh, success. Right. Uh, is, is a pretty cool thing to be a part of and to have felt like I, I've been along with that journey and, and contribute to some parts of it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think, uh, um, when you say hires, um, you know, it, it's really about the people and, the, and I think you're very much a sort of people person. And, uh, that's something I've, I've sort of seen in you is that you're, you're very connected to the staff and you like that development process but also spending time with the people and like you say they've all got the same interest and passion of of the video games that kind of sort of ties them together and i know that you know i mentioned it earlier but uh, when when heavy iron was sort of saved from the axe by going in independent uh, i think one time you mentioned like you know this is good because all these people get to keep paying their mortgages and having their families and you know uh and uh that that's something that i think when when i first heard you heard you say that i didn't really think much of it but after a while it kind of sort of seeped in and and i'd see other studios close and i'd start to think about it like wow you know 100 people have got to go home tell the family that sorry you know no income coming i've got to start interviewing and you know they might have to move and change schools and all that stuff it's a pretty real moment when you walk into a studio that you've probably been in God, i don't know you know 15 times over over a period of three or three-ish years uh you know you you don't see those people that often but you remember their names you know not that many of them and, and you walk into their yeah they think it's just another visit from you know the, the mothership yeah the mothership you know to see the latest stuff and talk about new projects and, and i mean they actually probably all thought we were talking about what we were, they would be doing next and, you know, literally 15, 20, 30 minutes into their day, got everybody together. And, you know, these are people that I had met some of their wives, you know, we'd been gone out a couple of times when I was there for a couple of days. So, you know, especially just as you get older too, and you, your life expands, you know, you start probably doing this if you're a young person, you get this because you want to make video games, right? And mm -hmm. then you get all this other stuff that, you know, you gather in life, you know, relationships, responsibilities and things like that. Uh, and, and that's the thing about heavy iron is, is that the studio is built mostly with those kind of people, um, not people who just had got into games only because they wanted. I mean, we, by the time we were hundred something people, we had lots of those people too, but there were a number of, of industry veterans that were parents that had, you know, we hired, they wanted a job at heavy iron. They wanted to come work here because they could show their kids their work mm -hmm. and they'd worked on all kinds of things that they couldn't show their kids. And they were proud of those games, but their lives had changed and mm -hmm. they're, you know, they're, so they wanted to do something different, you know? And, and so, especially again, you combine that sort of Boston experience of telling all those people, you know, you're going to go home and tell, you know, whomever it is that you're not, you know, you're not working here anymore. And it's not because of anything you guys did, not your fault. Right. Uh, that's pretty brutal mm -hmm. to see the look on people's faces as they, you know, kind of process that information. Uh, you know, and I mean, come on, how many times did I have to lay off people at, at heavy iron as we closed the heavy iron studio part of thq and transitioned into the private company um and it's not like any time it ever got less sucky or better or there was anything good about it um it made it less awkward to come up with what to say because you at least had figured out you know kind of what not to say mm -hmm. uh at least so that that's why all those things are important you know you want you want you, know, you realize that there's a there's something bigger than just making the game it's the people making the games right mm-hmm um, so I think we've reached about the end of, uh, about the end of our time. What's, uh, what's coming up next for heavy iron? Um, you know, nothing that we can announce specifically or, or, uh, or, or talk about in terms of identifying, you know, a specific product. Um, you know, there's some more infinity 3.0 stuff coming, uh, for iOS and Android. 
uh, between now and the holiday. Um, can't say what that is either, but uh, uh, there's some good stuff coming. Uh, and uh, you know, we'll continue to support that, that game and that product as long as uh, that makes sense for, uh, for everybody. Uh, we've got a few more SKUs of Fat City on digital console and, and iOS. Uh, we are doing the localizations and going through the process of publishing that stuff in Europe. Um, and then we've got you know, a handful of other things that we're working on um, that I'm pretty excited about that are uh, ours, really. And uh, there's a couple things that we're working on that are small that uh, are not ours that we're helping out. And uh, can't, can't talk about those right now, but that's stuff that's coming out next year. Um, one thing that we can't talk about that we did was we did some VR stuff recently for, uh, for The Martian, for uh, oh, the third floor and the, the virtual reality company. And uh, it's fun and exciting to be dealing with new hardware and new technology, you know, things like the Oculus and the Vive and the gear. And it'll be fun to see how all that stuff plays out you know, as it uh, goes to market next year. That's cool. Well, while that's been brilliant, uh, I always enjoy well, talking so. to you. And, and uh, Same, like we can do it again without the microphone and with some carnitas. Uh, that, that sounds, or we do it with the carnitas and the microphone. Yeah. And we talk about Mexican food. <laughs> and, and somehow how that intersects into video games. Sounds good. All right. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for listening. The show's excellent intro music is by Lazyitis, who you can find at soundcloud.com. The intro voice and audio production were by Garner Knutson. You can see the show notes and more at jollygoodjobs.com slash show. The Jolly Good Show comes to you from jollygoodjobs.com, where companies can make free job postings, which attract developers in their local area. Toodle pip!